Welcome back to Talent Horizon, where we explore the frontier of talent management and technology. I'm Helge, your AI tech expert. And I'm Lee Cooper, your go-to person for all things recruitment. Today, we've a special guest, Joshua Pines. Joshua, can you kick us off by sharing a bit about your tech journey and your role at Serenum? Thanks, Lee, and nice to see you both here. Thanks so much for having me. So I'm the Vice President for International Alliances at Bullhorn. What brought me to Bullhorn was that I had been the co-founder and head of marketing and alliances at a company called Serenum. And in the summer of 21, uh, Bullhorn acquired Serenum. Joshua, you've been deeply involved in technology that benefits not only workers, but clearly staffing agencies. So from your perspective, what tech advancements really move the needle for profitability? At the risk of being Captain Obvious, we look at profitability, there's two ways, right? Increase revenue, lower cost. I think within the former process of increasing revenue for generations, staffing agencies focus purely on selling more upfront or the sort of analog of recruiting more workers. But I think what's changed in the last six to eight years, perhaps, we now know, and and perhaps more importantly, we have the facility or that we have the technology to facilitate that actually better operations can impact both increased revenue and lower costs and also reduce risk. But that's not making a big move from a profitability perspective. So you see that a more efficient or even automated process, and I know we're going to talk about automation and AI and all that good stuff, but driving that through operations can allow you to do things like place more people, which drives more revenue, more quickly, so you can do more within a period of time and at a lower cost. So you're actually able to move both needles. One of the challenges that we see with many agencies is change management and getting recruiters to work in a different manner. Have you picked up any good advice to kind of do that change management process? Part of it is a little bit about related to what I was talking about earlier in terms of cultural impact of senior management, right? Even in relatively flat organizations, teams look to senior managers, senior leadership to to drive through and demonstrate a commitment, right? So there is no successful change management that happens without senior leaders being committed to it. Any organization that allows a product, a project or product manager to own it and not have senior sponsorship, it'll fail. Look, a lot of change management fails anyhow. It's hard enough, right? We're not here saying it's easy, but that's a big part of it. But I think any change, it's there are three levers, right? People, process, and technology. This was sort of mother's milk at Deloitte and PwC and in most management consultants. And I've, I've never been proven wrong when bringing that up, right? You can move the levers on one, two or all three, but you can't ignore any of the three in, in, in adopting one or the other. Companies that have tried to do things like workforce management based on old technology have built kind of ridiculous processes because the old technology can't do. But in the absence of better technology, you, you do what you can to, to make it happen. So I think there, there's three things that, that drive success and change. So one is remembering people, process, technology. It's always some summary of the three, some algorithm of the three. Senior leadership, sponsorship, and engagement is huge. And then really measuring, understanding how you measure things, that you need to measure things at the beginning. And a lot of times we find, and this applies to both my time at Bullhorn and and at Serenum previously, that just developing the ability to measure something is actually the change that's needed in many businesses because they're completely flying blind. I really believe in this as well. You can improve what you measure, otherwise it gets really hard. Do you see that the KPIs change when you implement the, or improve the process or do the KPIs mostly stay the same? It's interesting, you even use the phrase, we have a concept at Bullhorn called the metrics that matter. For the most part, the best KPIs are measurable throughout um, a process and throughout a change. But there's three that stand out, particularly in higher volume temp, churn, Utilization rate and temp to recruiter ratio are the three that I like to really focus on. So by churn, how many people do you have to recruit every week to replace the temps who are no longer working with your agency? We often would talk about what would be an impact of reducing churn by even a small number, 10%, 15%. And then you realize that, for example, we had a client that they were pretty good on measuring the onboarding costs and they, they actually had gotten and pretty good about managing the costs, but they weren't good about utilizing the, the, the workers uh, or managing the churn once they brought them on. So 
They had figured out that it was about 200 pounds per worker to onboard. These are lower wage workers. So 200 is obviously low. We see well into the thousands of some of our higher um, value clients and higher value placements, but they were hiring 500 workers per month just to keep up. And, and that's because they couldn't manage the churn, churn. They weren't keeping these workers engaged. So that's a hundred thousand pounds per month just to keep up with demand. Even just a 15% improvement in that, which isn't that much, right? It's not that many works. That's 15,000 pounds per month. And this one little sliver of their business, that's a, it's a big move. And I think one of the things, and you probably see this as well at Globus is some of the impacts, they don't have to move the needle too much to make a pretty big impact because these are areas that have been so overlooked. And that's where you get to something like utilization. So why were they having so much churn? Because their workers weren't being utilized and people went to other agencies or went to different lines of work. So how many of your temps worked in the last week or the last three months or the last six months within your database? How many are currently out in a placement? If you're thinking more long-term placement, did you sell over that period, time period or how much, how many placements did you sell? That's your utilization. Pretty simple KPI, right? But it has a a very clear impact on your bottom line and on your gross profit, right? So even a 5% improvement in those numbers will have a dramatic impact on your efficiency and operations because it'll increase the hours per worker. It'll increase the engagement. It'll reduce the churn. So it's just a, there's a snowball effect there. So that, that same client I was talking before, they had this enormous bench of workers that just sat around and they, they had gone through the onboarding process and they had kept track of all their key information and they used cycles internally to keep them, their data aligned and awake and accurate, but they were leveraging only 70% of 17% of those people's brought, people brought in and they were considered a market leader. Right. 83% of people went through that whole process at 200 pounds a pop and then just sat there, did nothing. You know, I've been a management consultant where you sometimes aren't on a project and boy, you hear it from senior management if you don't get on a project soon. Right. And staffing agencies are just like consulting firms in that vein. Right. But they don't realize that they're, that they've spent, you know, that there's this, some cost that will just continue to multiply if they don't do something about getting those people out. And again, a lot of them is because they just, they don't measure it. And then the, the last thing is the ratio, right? So ratio of, of temps to recruiters. Most businesses can't calculate that. And that is across the board from high value IT placements or accounting or, you know, professional white collar placements all the way down to cleaners and picker packers and logistics facilities. Can't, they can't measure it. And I like to, this is an example, another example where there's a, an increase in this drives a direct increase in EBITDA or gross margin, depending on what some other factors are. For example, when we look at ratios in the high volume space where 20 to one is actually not great performance, right? But a lot of players would think that they're about that, right? So that's 50 recruiters to a thousand workers out in the field, um, which is a 20 to one ratio. If you're consultants with either better efficiency, automation, AI, can manage just five more people, then you're going to see an increase of gross profit of 50, 25%. So that, that's huge. <laughs> and these are back to my point is sometimes you're just looking for these small victories, which actually move the needle a lot. And the truth is because, and you've probably seen this at Globus, because some of these businesses have done almost nothing on this front, especially in high volume temp, we've seen growth of two, two thirds in terms of improvement on this ratio by stripping out some of the manual tasks and just increasing that efficiency throughout those processes, whether it's communications to the candidates on the sort of professional long-term placement side or things like reminders of a shift about to start on the shift worker side. So all of these things move the needle pretty dramatically and gives a lot more free time back to your operations teams, your recruitment consultants. I love your KPIs. It's, these are very relevant and but when you're buying technology, how long do you have to measure this to actually see the effect? Because at least for us, we see that sometimes there are so many different factors impacting it. You have the recruiter, you have the candidates, you have market conditions, you have seasonal trends. I think that there's a couple of ways to skin this cat, right? I like to talk, there's statistical significance, and then there's also directional significance. I do love data, but I'm not a data scientist as you are by training. So perhaps my bar is a little bit lower for getting it accurate and a little bit more driven by kind of the Silicon Valley mentality of break and learn. Incidentally, it's random. We, you, know, you hear a lot about fail fast. And actually we, we had a 
phrase that was learn fast, right? So we'd have fail, cross it out. And it's all about learning. And I think the best staffing agencies and the best organizations that are managing these kind of things within staffing agencies are, are going in with that mentality as well. Two different divisions adapt technology, but this one leverages X process and this one leverages Y process. And then give it three months and compare. The, the, the flip side of the, the, that mentality, have is that you never make a move because you're afraid you're not going to be able to measure the, the impact. Yeah, it's always hard to measure this thing, but we found a, a nice way to solve part of it, at least, and also impact the change management, which is identifying some early adopters, maybe young recruiters, ambitious, new in the organization. And then you give a small group of them the new tool, they get really good results. And then you spark this competitive thing as well, which is inherent in a lot of recruiters. I think that's a great idea. Again, it starts with being able to measure, right? So even knowing which of those sort of early adopters, who they are, is not easy. You've got to get some level of adoption to start, but I think it's a great idea. I think to your point, Joshua, as someone who's spent 30 years in recruitment and staffing, permanent recruitment, executive search, the whole gambit of recruitment operating models, I think the biggest challenge is that the data has, you know, there's copious amounts of data and as a consequence, KPIs that that literally run through at the core of every recruitment organization I've ever seen. I think there's two things. One, the integrity of that data, I think has always historically been an issue. And I wonder as to the implications of AI and how that starts to improve the integrity and, and enhance the integrity of that data over time. But I think to your point as well, management, if I reflect back on my own career, how those KPIs are being used to affect performance, whether they're being used as a stick by which to beat people, or whether they're being used as a tool by which to inform and develop and enhance and train. I think that's also a, yeah, it's a bit simplistic to put it in those two camps, but part of it I think is how management are utilizing the information at hand to drive performance within the organization. Most recruiters I've ever known are inherently curious, hugely competitive, have a desire to improve and enhance their own performance, certainly the ones that are really gonna succeed. So I think the issue is data management, and how that data evolves. And I think AI could be a, a great enhancer in terms of solving some of these issues. I think you're right, Lee. And I would add also that there's process changes that come in to driving success there. Having better measurement, good. Having better measurement with transparency, better. Let your recruiters know when they're doing a good job. Let them know nicely and encouragingly if they're not doing a good job. There, There's certainly a a mentality out there that certain agencies, senior leadership wants the analytics and access to the data, but won't share it. And that is really counterproductive. What should agencies be focusing their attention on when picking tech solutions or the right tech partnerships? There's a lot of talent out there with ideas that are just itching to get into the market. But more broadly, I think the sort of the platform mentality, allowing you to have that healthy mix of well-capitalized organizations in your tech stack um, that you're going to entrust your future and then smaller, more agile upstarts to drive the innovation on the fringes. Is you have to really think about it like a portfolio, like an investment portfolio, right? You want that diversification so that you can take risks. You mentioned earlier this technology process and people. And I think in a lot of technology discussion, culture doesn't get maybe enough attention. So how does a leader's style affect the tech adoption? It starts with what I was talking about before in terms of transparency, visibility, and also the sort of engagement or involvement of senior leadership. That's a big part of driving the culture. When you get down to it, like how do you get them to join the team and kind of embrace new tools and, and change? So, so I think the first thing is expectations management. And that is that you're not gonna get everybody to agree. Right. So for your own sanity and for managing your, if, if you're managing up your board's expectations, you're managing down your direct reports expectations, there will be some people who don't join on board. And you know what? It's not optimal and there's missed opportunities when that's the case, but you're a lot more likely to find success focusing on the ones who are maybe on the fence than the ones who are definitively against it. Focus on the ones who are in that middle who are maybe not doing it great, not, adopt, not adopting technology in every process, uh, but willing to, I think that's where you, you're going to have more success and you're going to see a broader and more successful adoption of technology across the way. And then listen, at the end of the day, again, it's back to people processing technology. They don't act in a vacuum and, and the buy-in from the top down to drive that is, is crucial. What about with respect to how 
technology can identify and nurture talent within an agency, Joshua? I, I think there's a lot of things. Real, one really basic thing is we're seeing a lot more adoption throughout our customer base of auto matching based on skills, right? So that's whether that's at the level of just building a short list, so think of a long-term placement, and you've got to quickly get a short list together of 15 candidates for five slots, for example. Auto matching based on skills, and the technology is getting better on both hard and soft skills, that's a no-brainer right now. And we've got it built from an automation perspective so that you're saving your recruiters a dramatic amount of time up front. Taking it to a sort of more on the ground level, we, we talk about workforce management and the kind of things we can do to build out rosters with, with auto matching and auto assignment. That's another thing that can do a good job of identifying with much less human touch but then the human touch can be layered on to take advantage of what we do best, which is identifying aspects that our, our eyes can see, but AI and, and automation wouldn't be able to, our history, our experience. And I think we talked about earlier in terms of, I think it was how I used the term, making informed decisions or better informed decisions. And, and I think that's really what it gets back to is like, how can technology drive more informed decisions? And that's an intentional double entendre because you want... The decisions to be more informed and you want to be making more decisions because that's the whole point of automation is to try to accelerate certain steps in the process. But I also think of it in terms of nurturing from a marketing perspective and a marketing automation perspective, because you want to nurture that relationship as well. You want to keep the, that candidate and the talent aware of what's happening within your agency, within the relationships with your clients, within the opportunities for things like upskilling. And one of the things that automation uh, is doing right now and AI layered on that, that's a huge uh, area of impact to, to opening the door to, to nurturing that talent and, and nurturing that relationship as well. I think that's where mainly the competitive advantage will evolve around this candidate experience, the agencies that can really hone in and improve that and combine technology with the human experience. And you mentioned automation. AI is sometimes an enabler of automation. Seeing AI now, and, and you have a pretty good overview of the market, how do you see the technology both having changed candidate experience and, and how do you think that will evolve going forward? We've talked a lot about the productivity gains and I think what's amazing about what we're seeing, and we're just still scratching the surface of it, believe me, but that surface is getting, we're getting under it now. But I think one of the things that's really, what's really cool about it is obviously new levels of productivity, but also we're increasing accuracy. We talked about the challenge of data and finding it and making sure it's right. So organizations are, who, are, who are adopting AI and automation, they're getting things done faster. They're getting more things done and they're doing it with fewer mistakes. So the experience of candidates it's a better experience, right? You have better communication, right? They're getting the right jobs the first time. They're getting their, if, even taking a step back, you're more likely to have the right phone number for talent these days if you're leveraging automation and AI. You're more more likely to have the right email address. And that means you're not gonna, you're less likely to miss opportunities to communicate with that talent about either upskilling opportunities or a new job or whatever. And then the ones that are doing it right are also leveraging things like the GPTs of the world to better craft their messages, either one-on-one -on -one messages to talent about opportunities, about updating their information, about their availability, what have you or more mass communications like job descriptions. I think one of the interesting examples that we've seen here is this where new technology, you need to change your mindset a bit, especially in temp recruitment. You'll see recruiters just making sure to send it to enough candidates because then they'll be sure to get a response. In my mind, it's spamming. They're gaming the system. Yeah, you just send it to everyone. And, and the cost of doing that is not well defined or measured in any way. So here comes AI, it gives you better accuracy. So maybe you just need to send it to 10 people because it's pretty accurate on giving you the candidates that will actually respond, but still you end up sending it to a hundred. So I think that's a, it's an interesting example. Of Part of the challenge with that is fear. The fear for the recruiter is if I don't send it to Helga or Josh and someone else does, and they happen to get there before I do, I lose that opportunity. There's all sorts of dynamics, I think, at play here. It's also incumbent, I think, on the staffing agency to educate and inform the client base around the risks. Because oftentimes, I think the client perceives, if I brief multiple agencies, they're going to work so much harder for me to get the solution I need because they're all competing with each other and I'm going to get the best outcome. It doesn't always drive the best outcome. 
So I, I think it's incumbent on staffing agencies to educate the client perspective oftentimes around the risks inherent with doing, with adopting a multi-agency strategy. But I have a biased perspective. But fear is one part. I think trust in new technology Fear and well. trust. At least we yeah. see that it takes time to build that trust in the technology actually giving you those accurate recommendations. Uh, yeah. I, I was going to ask, actually, you, you covered a lot about anything agencies can do practically to up their game when it comes to, to candidate experience. But um, you've covered a lot there, Joshua. I appreciate it. Thank you. But as we wrap up, is there any perhaps any other last minute wisdom that you might impart for those agencies who maybe are hesitant about new technology? Was it cliche to say adapt or die? I feel like that's the landscape these days. There's so much happening. There's so much on your radar. And look, I, I think it's, we're seeing our most successful clients diversifying their offering. So market conditions are such that they, you want to have some diversity in your offering. And of course, they're leveraging new technology and the associated process and, and people adjustments to be able to do that. So the flip side is you're, by adopting new technology, especially in an environment like we're facing these days, you're opening up the door for yourself to be able to build models and build new offerings while reducing risk that you couldn't do otherwise. And, and I, I think there's just so much potential in our space. We, we, we're just scratching the surface of, we, I can't believe we've been on this for whatever, 70 minutes or so and haven't used the phrase, the gig economy, but oh, it's not going anywhere. And the more that agencies realize that they can diversify and broaden and expand their scope because of the impacts of the, the gig economy and you know, the more potential they have both at a sort of individual company level and that we have as an industry across the entire market space. You need to keep yourself relevant in the gig economy to survive for sure. And I think technology is the key to doing that. Where can our listeners follow you if they want more of your insights? So it's pretty simple. I'm Josh Pines on all major social platforms. Thank you, Joshua. And indeed, thanks to all our listeners. Until next time, keep pushing the boundaries of talent and technology. Thanks so much.